Welcome to Cambridge Health Alliance Health is Wealth. My name is Roberta Robinson. I'm Director of Marketing and Outreach for the Geriatric Division of the Cambridge Health Alliance, including the PACE program. And today I'm really happy to have Dr. Jason Friedman with us. And Dr. Friedman is an orthopedic surgeon specializing in shoulders. Now we know there are a lot of shoulder issues out there. And specifically in my own little world, I know a few people that have this rotator cuff. Um, issue and I know it's very painful so can you tell us what I wrote to well welcome first thank of all. you very nice and to be thank here you thanks for, for having coming me on board with us can you tell us what the rotator cuff yeah. is actually so the rotator cuff is uh, the structures in the shoulder that allow you to position your arm around the muscles come off the shoulder blade and then they turn into tendons and attach to the bone of the ball and socket joint on the ball part and that allows you to position your arm in space. So they're tendons. Tendons connect the muscles tendons to bone. tendons that come over the bone. Yep. So what there's four of them, and they kind of more or less attach together, and they form a cuff over the ball. Okay. And then when the muscles on your shoulder blade fire, they pull on the ball to position it in certain arm, in certain positions in space. So if people have rotator cuff issues, is it inflammation of those tendons? So there's, it can be. There's, there's usually it's either inflammation, which you'll typically see from overuse strain. Um, and then certainly in an older population, the tendons aren't as strong, so you get more of a degenerative type problem. You can get little micro tears, and if it gets significant enough, you can get a full thickness tear in the tendon. And that, so it might be one of those tendons that might give way, or would it be all of them? So or it more, those, it's case by case. So it's case by case, but in general, there's a one tendon on the top uh, called the supraspinatus. So you have a tendon in the front called the subscapularis. Okay. There's two tendons on the top of the shoulder, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, and there's one in the back called the teres minor, and those are all the muscles on the shoulder blade. The, the power horse, the most common one injured, is the supraspinatus, and that's the one that inserts onto the top. Uh, and that allows that one works by lifting the arm up. Uh, and that's the one that's most commonly affected in, in patients. Um, now, very common, as you said, pretty much you will either have shoulder problems yourself or you will know somebody who has shoulder problems. And a lot of times it can be related to the rotator cuff. Certainly in an older population, that's where we see um, a lot of the problem. So just, you know, say you're going, doing your shopping and, you know, reaching, picking up a lot of heavy things, you know, maybe strain to get something off the top shelf. Um, a lot of times you may not think anything about it. So when you have an inflammatory and overuse strain, it often doesn't hurt right away. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it'll take a day or so for kind of the inflammation build up and you get a little pain. So it's like two days later, like, oh, my shoulder, you wake up and now oh, my shoulder hurts, but you don't think you did anything. Because it takes a little bit of time for the inflammatory cells to do what they do and cause pain and swelling. And so you kind of localize pain, usually over the side or the front of the shoulder. And, you know, a lot of times it's very noticeable at night. Yeah. For whatever reason, rotator cuff problems always hurt at night. When you're trying to sleep and then you, because you're not paying attention, to, you're paying more attention, right? You're, you're it's either you try distracted. to sleep on the shoulder, but I always think it's the same thing. Because a lot of people, for, not even just shoulders, will say, oh, it hurts more at night. Because you're right, it's quiet, it's dark, and you kind of just localize the pain more. But rotator cuff tendon problems, especially at night. For that and also, you know, a lot of times people lie on their shoulder. Mm. So most people, you know, will have trouble lifting up the arm, positioning it around, they'll kind of guard their activity, um, and then they have problems and then they, they wind up coming to see me. <laughs> so treatment for rotator cuff. So uh, what we'll do initially is, you know, do a good thorough history to kind of, you know, a lot of times you can figure out what the problem is just by talking to the patient. Something very simple that, you know, a lot of situations uh, is a lost art, but if you talk to your patient and, you know, ask the right questions, you can pretty much figure out everything without having to examine them or see an x-ray or an MRI. Wow. So you listen to the patient, find out what the problem is, and a lot of times you, you can figure out what's going on, but we still, hands on, uh, do a good exam, kind of see where the deficiencies are, see what elicits the pain, and from that can kind of determine the best treatments. Now, you know, most of these time for these kind of overuse strain inflammations, um, you know, if it's really acutely painful, obviously you need to calm down the pain a little bit so you can be a little bit more productive when you're trying to do your other treatments, your exercises, your therapy. So uh, icing, heat, and, you know, everyone asks, what's better, ice or heat? And and we hate that ice pack, but yeah. sometimes it does help because it yeah. reduces the swelling, So right? what, what I always tell everybody, whatever feels better. Yeah. Now, usually after, an, if you have a traumatic injury, you know, you fall and you hit your shoulder, usually ice is going to be better for that acute swelling, like you said. But, you know, kind of the more that muscle, achy pain, um, warm heat 
will often help that. But like I said, whatever helps. Um, what about alternating? Does, does, is yeah. that good too? Like I said, you know, I, I said, everyone always asks that, whatever helps. Well, there you have it. <laughs> and then oftentimes, you know, anti-inflammatory medication like Advil, which is ibuprofen, um, Aleve, which is naproxen, you can get over the counter and will help with pain, but it's also for inflammation as well. And that can often help your symptoms. And that's usually a good place to start, get the pain a little bit under um, better management. And oftentimes, depending on how severe the patient's condition is, um, we'll demonstrate and give them a little packet with some exercises and stretches to work on at home, which is going to be important no matter what. Some people require formal physical therapy, more of that hands-on guided approach. Well, for one thing, it makes them accountable and they have to do it if they, if they show up at an appointment. Yes. They get a little lax when yes. they're home and if it hurts, they don't want you to do it, right? Correct. Sometimes you're right. They need a little kick in the butt. <laughs> to uh, encourage them to, to be more productive and it's, get their shoulder better. That's true. So when when you first heard it, you need to let that calm down. That wouldn't be the time to exercise it, would it? Correct. You know, it, it if there's an acute injury, if it's just, you know, onset of pain, you could certainly, you know, move it around as you feel comfortable. But obviously, if you slip, you fall, you want to let it calm down a little bit because you don't want to, you know, make the pain a lot worse. Right. Now, certainly if it's very severe and it certainly lasts a couple of days, it's important to get it checked out because there could be a more significant issue. Now, obviously, if you fall on it, it's swollen, it's bruised, you should probably come in and see your doctor right away because that may be a more significant problem, such as a fracture or even a tendon rupture that may need to be addressed in a more acute situation. But as we go on, and if it, if um, sometimes we end up with these chronic things, and yes. we end up with this chronic pain, and then through that pain we should move it, though, right? Yes, you that's know, what I keep telling my people. Yeah. But yeah. So if you just it'll be good to have a doctor say that. To yes. You, if it's listen true. to Roberta. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so it, it it is very important to move the shoulder around. Um, it can get stiff, right? And that can make things worse. What you can get is something that we commonly call a frozen shoulder. And what happens is the, the lining of the shoulder joint can get inflamed. Inflammation is painful. Um, so you're gonna limit your arm. But what happens is that kind of baseline inflammation will go away. But what happens is that lining of the shoulder joint, the capsule gets scarred and it gets tight, it's stuck. Oh. So you can't move your arm around. And the way we differentiate that, you know, you'll have a patient say, I can only get my arm up so high. But then what we'll do is try to passively elevate the arm up and you can feel it, it's stuck. Oh. Now, it That's will get, not a good thing. It's not a good thing. And it's because it's, like I said, a lot of people that baseline pain will calm down, but just when you get to that point where you're trying to reach your rotator and you get that point that it's stuck, that's when it hurts. And the natural history of that problem is if you don't do anything, it will get better on its own, but it can take a very, very long time, months or usually even years to kind of get wow. the full motion back. The main thing you got to do is you got to stretch, stretch. And then you gotta do more stretching. That's really the most important thing is stretching the shoulder out in that, in that specific type of problem when if you're getting a frozen shoulder. And so can you show me with one arm how yes. you would, how you would so, do that? So what you have to do is use some other force or modality to stretch the shoulder out. So if you're just trying to do this, it's not gonna be productive. So what you have to do is use your other arm and bear with me here, I have my own shoulder injury recently. Um, and you try to use your other arm to help lift it up and you're gonna get to that point where it feels tight and it feels stuck and you gotta push through it a little bit so what I always tell everyone you push through a little bit it's gotta hurt just a little bit you know obviously you're gonna kill yourself just a little bit and you hold it for a count of ten and then you let it rest and then you do that ten times and do that three or four times a day with maybe all the each exercises. time you get it a little higher exactly. and a little higher that's the goal right exactly exactly what about um, bands so bands resistance bands are good for or for strengthening so the, the motion aspect of it, the stretching, and there's other things that we'll do. If you go to physical therapy, they'll typically give you a little pulley you put over oh, the door yes. My mother had and help that. pull it up. And there's other things, leaning up against the wall when you're lying down, pushing the shoulder down one way or the other. And then as the motion starts to get better, then you kind of progress to strengthening, which are the resistance bands, therabands, right. as they're referred to. And they're basically just big old rubber bands. And they're different colors, and the colors usually uh, designate um, how how tough it is. And right. you obviously start with the lighter ones. And as I'm a black do, band. Wow, <laughs> that's that's pr that's high up there. You're probably pretty pretty Correct. strong. <laughs> well, because I have a cervical disc disc issue, and they said you've got to keep the muscles strong to keep that disc in place. Well, one time that disc came out and jammed that nerve. 
I never want that to happen again. So every morning I use those bands. Yeah, and that's the morning. important thing. And then, you know, as your pain gets better, it, it is important to maintain the strength and maintain your stretching. So even when the condition gets better, your pain gets better, it's still a good idea to, you know, do the exercises, you know, two or three times a week to kind of maintain the tone and flexibility and hopefully prevent the issue from coming back. Absolutely. So that's only one shoulder problem, right? Yes. So we spent a lot of time on that, we but did. That's, it is we a did. very common one. It is. Frozen shoulders we see very commonly. Um, and, and rotator cuff. Well, there's more to talk about the rotator cuff. Oh. There's a lot more to talk about the rotator cuff. <laughs> okay. Um, which we can delve into or kind of go on. Well, let's, we'll kind of start with the, the easier, the more common things. Okay. So um, just rotator cuff tendinitis, which is inflammation, bursitis, is kind of a condition that we refer to as impingement syndrome. What can happen is with repetitive lifting and overhead activities, that rotator cuff can kind of rub on the under surface of the shoulder blade. It gets pinched, impingement, hence the name. But it, in general, it kind of incorporates tendinitis, bursitis, again, overuse. And again, a lot of the treatments are going to be the same. But tendinitis and bursitis are two different things, aren't they? Yes, technically they are. Tendinitis is inflammation in the tendons. Bursitis is inflammation on the little sac that cushions between the tendons and the bone, but they often go hand in hand. And they're both painful. And they both can be painful. <laughs> yes. Has anyone's had it? So the treatment is probably great. similar? The treatment is similar. Mm -hmm. You know, the exercise, the therapy, ice or heat, um, will often uh, offer cortisone injections. So mm -hmm. cortisone is an anti-inflammatory medication that you can inject around the tendons or around the bursa. It helps decrease inflammation, helps improve pain. And that way, as the pain gets better, then you can be more productive in doing your exercises and strengthening the muscles. Right. We can't take that for granted. We have to keep doing those exercises. Yes. Yes. Okay. What's, what's next? So, again, as you know, older patients, the tendon's not as strong. So what do you call older patients? Uh, anyone older than me? <laughs> uh, no. 50s, so, 60s, so in general, 70s? Yeah. So in general, we'll, we'll see this condition more in patients in their 50s and older. Um, really? In younger patients, you see other types of problems, but in general, these more wear and tear degenerative conditions, you'll start to see 50s, 60s, 70s, and older. Wow. And like I said, as the I'm ten surprised it's so young. That's it is. It, it can be. It yeah. can be. Um, so again, this little overuse strain in the tendon, you get little micro degeneration in the tendon, little micro tears. But what can happen is those tears can get larger. And you know that can you can still see patients with very similar symptoms, but usually more of a longer period of time with pain. And obviously, initially we try the conservative treatments, medications, the injections, the therapy. But then, if patients don't get better despite those modalities, we want to look at the tendon in more detail. So we usually will get an MRI. So an MRI is a a, a radiographic test that uses magnets that shows the internal structures, as opposed to just an X-ray which shows the bones. So an MRI uh, will show us the tendon, and we can see if there's tears in the tendon. And that's a very common thing that we'll, we'll see um, in, 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 in patients. Can you see if it, it inflammation on an MRI? You can. You can. So um, without going into too much technical detail, you can see certain areas brighter, oh. which on an MRI usually indicate inflammation uh -huh. uh, around the bursa. And sometimes if there's a lot of inflammation, there'll be fluid. Um, and you can see that on an MRI too, and that can help confirm uh, the issue that's going on. But again, a lot of these conditions go hand in hand. It's not you just have bursitis, or you just have tendonitis, or you just have rotator cuff tearing. They all kind of you get them all. They all kind of go together. Uh, all for one and one for all. So in patients who have uh, rotator cuff tears, usually in a more chronic setting, um, we'll obviously we'll, we'll try those conservative treatments first, like we had discussed before. Um, now, Exercise and anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, cortisone injections, and for most patients that will help control the symptoms. Now in someone who has a rotator cuff tear, most of the time it's what we initially what we term a partial tear. So the tendons again insert on the bone, but there's a certain thickness to the tendon. And sometimes part of that thickness, part of the tendon is attached, but part is still attached. We call those partial tears. And in what we term atraumatic. So it's not like if you fell and got the tear, that's a different situation, but more degenerative tearing over time, we treat conservatively first. Mm. Because a lot of times you can compensate by strengthening the other muscles in the shoulder, even if you have the tear. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Do you ever surgically go in? We'll get to that. Oh. <laughs> You're stealing my thunder. Uh -oh. I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, initially, like I said, we try the conservative treatments, but in someone who has persistent pain, 
then there's certainly an option to do a surgery. And we do a minimally invasive, it's called arthroscopy, where we make a couple of small incisions around the shoulder and look inside with the camera. Now we'll clean out the inflammation, there's little bone spurs we often trim down, but then we look at the tendon. How do you clean out inf inflammation? So again, inflammation is in Swelling, the bursa. Isn't it? Well, you can have fluid, but you can have inflamed bursal tissue. Oh. Which is actual, it's actual tissue. tissue. So you clean out, so you have little, little devices that go in and shave it out, okay. basically. So we clean that up. And then you look at the tendon. And now sometimes if it's only a small portion of the tendon that's torn and there's just some frayed edges, some loose flaps, you just smooth those out. Okay. Uh, but in a partial tear, if more than 50% of the tendon is torn, you'll want to repair that because there's a very high chance that will progress to a full thickness tear. Um, so there's different ways that we repair that surgically, reattaching it down to the bone. So do you like pull it over? So it depends. Now if it's not some, so basically you can have different components of the tear. So it can be just be detached and it's sit right on top of the bone and you can attach that right back down. In more chronic situations where the tear has progressed to a full thickness tear where the entire width of the tendon is detached, over time it will retract back. Now, if you wind up, if you can get to it and operate on it before it gets scarred in and tight, then you can mobilize it, put it back to where it needs to go on the normal part of the humeral head and reattach that. And we use uh, um, what are called suture anchors that go into the bone and have sutures, you know, basically these very strong strings attached to it that we incorporate into the tendon tear and pull it over and reattach it down to the bone. I was going to ask how you attach it. Yep. Yeah. Wow. It's fascinating. It is. I like doing it. It's, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. I like doing it. Um, but uh, fun on your end. Not it's easy. Other. It is easy for me to say that. Correct. Yeah. Um, but the the smaller the tears are, uh, the easier they are to repair, and the more reproducible the recovery is. Um, when the tears get very large, what will happen, and this is usually over time, um, well, patients, you know, they don't necessarily come in right away. Their shoulder hurts a little bit, and progressively. Um, the tears can get larger over time, but a lot of times people compensate for it, so they don't think it's that bad and come in right away. And sometimes they'll come in and the tear is almost the whole part of the tendon. It's retracted, it's scarred in, and in those situations you aren't able to repair them. So they're stuck with it? Um, we have some tricks uh, <laughs> that we can do uh, surgically. Uh, to uh, Sometimes we'll sew in a graft to uh, replace the rotator cuff. Uh, the graft is from a cadaver uh, oh. of uh, dermal skin, usually. It has collagen in it, and collagen is what makes up all tendons, right. and it's very strong. And what we can do in certain situations is attach it between the ball and the socket to uh, compensate for not having a rotator cuff. One of the things that will happen in patients who uh, don't have a rotator cuff is they can get a type of arthritis which is a whole other discussion to have, which I guess we can kind of delve into a little bit. Well, does it just have a name? So it's called rotator cuff arthropathy. Oh. So it does, someone, someone came up with the terminology and put a name <laughs> on it. So the rotator cuff, in addition to positioning the arm in space, keeps the ball, your shoulder's a ball and socket joint, keeps the ball centered in the socket. So what can happen when you don't have a functioning rotator cuff is the ball tends to sheet up a little bit. So it's not rolling normally in the socket. So if it's rolling what we term eccentrically, it can cause the cartilage to wear out in the shoulder and that's where you can get arthritis. So in situations where you have a deficient rotator cuff, you wanna try and recenter the ball before you get the arthritis. And by sewing that graft between the ball and the socket, it will keep the ball centered in the socket. That procedure is called a superior capsular reconstruction. Wow. Another big, another big term that somebody put on it. Right, another yeah. big term. Um, so the moral of the story is, I guess, if you have a shoulder issue, I would suggest going to see your doctor yes. sooner rather than later, yes. and not you be the doctor. Let them tell yes. you what's going on before it gets to another so, level. Correct. So right? rotator, rotator cuff tears are, are very common. Um, they are. So there's been some studies looking at the incidence of rotator cuff tears, and people are even asymptomatic. So a lot of people are walking around with rotator cuff tears don't even know about it. Uh, people in their 50s, the estimate is about 15% of people will have an asymptomatic rotator cuff tear. And that number goes up each decade, uh, up to people in their 80s, about 36% of people will have an asymptomatic rotator cuff tear. Yeah. Um, and then obviously a lot of those patients go on to have pain 
and that's when they get seen by the doctor. Right. So I've been having a little issue. I better check it out because I don't want to end up with anything. Yeah, you don't have serious. to. You, you don't have to see me. I gotta, no, I got to keep moving and grooving here. Yeah. Um, so, is there anything more with the rotator cuff? Uh, that's probably a, g a good discussion for your for your viewers. So, what other shoulder issues might people have? So, another common issue that patients in the, in this age group will experience is arthritis. So, again, your shoulder's a joint. Um, ball and socket joint, and the ends of all the bones and joints are covered with cartilage. Um, it allows the joints to glide smoothly. And what I, the analogy I always give is, think of it as like a nice smooth road. Mm -hmm. So it allows the, the you know, like when you're no gliding bumps. over, exactly. So what can happen is that cartilage can wear out. And the example I give is, you know when they're repaving a road and it's like really rough? Mm -hmm. That's what arthritis is, is that cartilage starts to wear down and get thinner so the joint doesn't glide smoothly. And in a worst case scenario, when the cartilage all wears out, then you have bone rubbing on bone. Right. I, some people tell me they have bone on bone. You feel like a grinding sensation often. So that's painful? It can be very painful. That's painful. And there's nothing, there's nothing we can do for that? Well, again, it depends on what stages you catch it at. Now, um, obviously, in the initial stages of it, when it's only very mild, again, like most other uh, issues that we deal with, through non-invasive treatments usually first for pain management. Okay. I, um, the other things we talked about, icing, heating, anti-inflammatory medication, and exercises. Keeping the muscles strong will help protect the shoulder. So that's why it's important to do the exercises. So would it be like weightlifting? Is that good? Uh, yes. I mean, more... I mean, not... Yeah, you're not... You're not, you're not, you're not yeah, yeah. But, you know, I do five pounds. Yes. And it's not so... And uh, to be honest, it's not how heavy the weight. It's more building up the endurance in the muscles. So repetition. So even just a couple light weights, just doing a lot of the repetitions um, and doing it a couple times a week to help maintain the strength, the, the endurance, and the balance in the shoulder is very important. Mm. And then, you know, as, as, as the pain gets worse, we can progress to more invasive treatments like cortisone injections. Cortisone. Let's talk about cortisone yeah. because, you know, I know it is kind of a magic drug. And not for everybody, but in a lot of instances. It's a magic drug and, and something, there's a lot of preconceived, I have a lot of patients that come in who, be it their own research online or having told by friends of theirs, there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I can't get that. It, it's, it, you know, you can only get, you know, once or twice in your lifetime or it's, it can make things worse. So, uh, you know, a cortisone injection, you know, certainly in an isolated setting can be very effective for pain Is inflammation. Is it a steroid? It is. It's a, what's termed a corticosteroid. It's not like the steroids like the baseball players use. It's not going to make your head real big or your muscles real big. It's an anti-inflammatory steroid. It's like a very, very strong form of ibuprofen. Okay. Oh. And so while it doesn't fix the underlying problem, it's not going to fix the cartilage wearing down, but it will help decrease the inflammation and pain associated with it. So then your function is better. And that's the main goal of doing the cortisone injections. So once that, say if you're on bone on bone, we only have a few minutes. We, we have Time flies. Uh, we, right. Uh, when you're having fun. Yes. And I think we might have to come back to talk. There's more to talk about shoulders, isn't there? there there's a lot, there's Lots definitely more, more to talk about shoulders. But when you have bone, up, but there's no cartilage, is there any surgical procedure to give you cartilage? So in that situation, um, there's nothing that's going to regrow cartilage. Now, there are instances when you have another analogy I give about cartilage is a pothole. If you have an isolated pothole, there are uh, procedures, uh, cartilage restoration procedures that can be done. Now, those are more commonly done in other joints, more mostly the knee, mm. but there are some people looking at it, its uh, effectiveness doing it in the shoulder. Mm. There are other types of injections that are done for arthritis. Um, one of them that I'm using a lot more in my practice now is something called platelet-rich plasma, uh, or PRP for short. Platelet, so platelet, like blood platelet. So it, yes, it's your it's your blood your that we blood. we take out of your arm and we spin it down into a machine that separates it into platelets and growth factors. Um, my main specialty is sports medicine, and we've been using that in sports medicine for people who have tendon problems like tennis elbow or plantar fasciitis. But over the past oh, several years, I know what that's like. That's that's a whole <laughs> not, that's another that's another TV show in itself. Um, but people have been looking at that for arthritis uh, over the past several years, and. Definitely for the knee, it's been shown to be very effective, um, but I have started to do it in some patients with shoulder arthritis and see some promising results. Not a lot of studies in the literature, but it is, I think, an option before proceeding to surgery, which we can talk about in a second as well. So you take the blood, you spin it, you yep. get the platelets out. And growth factors. And the growth hormone, is that? Well, it's not growth hormone. Okay. That's something different. Okay. Growth factors that help 
Um, again, we know what some of these things do in the lab. We don't know exactly what it does in the body, but you inject it into the joint. Right. And the thought is it can help decrease um, factors that cause pain and inflammation and perhaps even factors that break down cartilage. We don't have evidence that it will regrow the cartilage, but there is a possibility it may slow down the breakdown of oh, the cartilage. Wow, that's so that's fascinating that, yeah, information. So that's a promising, promising um, uh, option potentially wow. for patients. That's great. In a worst case scenario, the surgical option where you, like I said, you can't really regrow cartilage completely in the joint. In that situation, we do a joint replacement where you put in um, metal components to replace the shoulder. Mm. So you put in a component, a ball on the, the ball side, you put a socket on the socket side, and so you have a metal ball rubbing on a plastic socket. And that's actually a very effective form of pain management. Patients, you know, because you don't have that irritated, inflamed, raw bone rubbing against each other. Right. So you take that away and pain can be dramatically better and function too, of course. So what's the recovery like after the So typically uh, you're either in the hospital for a night or two. Um, usually um, we'll keep you in a sling. Um, but depending exactly which specific type of shoulder replacement you have done, you'll usually start some gentle motion within the first week or so. Um, what I'll usually tell patients, you're kind of back to everyday light activities below shoulder level by about two to two and a half months. Overhead light activities, um, nothing heavy lifting, by usually three to four months. And, uh, you know, pitching for the Red Sox can be between <laughs> six and eight months. Although probably not with a shoulder That might have to wait a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we only have about a minute left. Um, is there, should we s summarize this or is there something else you could... Quickly. So, I mean, I think just to kind of summarize, you know, shoulder problems are very common in, in, all, in yeah. all patient populations, but particularly in, in the older patient population where the muscles are a little bit weaker, the tendons can get strained more, but also you have the arthritis component to it. Now, a lot of patient symptoms will present the same way. Um, and so it's important to be able to determine what exactly the problem is in order to prescribe the right treatment and make the right recommendations. So I think... Um, so just quickly, what other things would we be talking about? Just sort of a sneak preview for our next show. Well, I mean, it's probably just going to go into more detail about the more specific things for impingement syndrome. I like to talk about frozen shoulder, rotator cuff tears, arthritis. I mean, those are the main four, if you had to kind of generalize the different problems that we see. For the shoulder. Yeah, in an older and population. Can you um, give maybe a piece of advice to our people? Or, uh, one of them, I think, is if you have any issues, Go see yeah, you can always always see your doctor, uh, but the important thing is don't put it off, um, and, and like, like Roberto was saying, don't necessarily baby it. Right. You know, if you kind of just guard it and don't use it, the muscles are going to get weaker, and it can actually make the problem worse. So it is important to, you know, unless you have a very acute traumatic injury, to try and maintain your motion and strength and keep the flexibility and function. Well, thank you so much. You're quite um, we're going to have to come back and do another show. Thank you, and hopefully you learned. I learned a lot. That's why I keep doing the show. Thanks so much. Very good. You're quite welcome.